Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. This episode is sponsored by the town of Beaver Lodge. Now, Beaver Lodge is a community in the Peace River country, which is a beautiful area of Alberta. I used to live up there near Fairview, Alberta, and it's a really nice place with a lot of historical attractions throughout the region. And Beaver Lodge is one great place to visit because of all the amazing attractions and the history of the community, which I'm going to relate here. Now, this episode won't be a chronological look at the history of Beaver Lodge, but instead is going to go through various aspects of the community and its history. So let's begin. The Indigenous. Dating back thousands of years, the Indigenous people lived in the Beaver Lodge area along the Beaver Lodge River, which they had named Uzipa, meaning Temporary Lodge, by members of the Beaver First Nation. The Beaver people, whose original name was the Duneza, which means those who live among the beaver, originally had lands farther to the east as well, and inhabited to the west towards Fort St. John. In that area, artifacts from their ancestors have been found that date back 10,500 years. In the late 1700s, the area began to open up to fur trading, and Alexander Mackenzie was one of the first Europeans to arrive in the area, where he would establish Rocky Mountain Fort in 1794. The beaver name for the indigenous of the area comes from the English translation of the name used by neighboring tribes to the Deneza. Prior to the 1820s, bison were found as far north as Beaver Lodge and the Upper Peace River area, and indigenous traders would sell bison meat and grease to traders to use on their expedition. By 1823, when the Hudson's Bay Company was operating in the area, the bison were too scarce to be a viable trading commodity for the indigenous of the area. The first settlers arrive. As the west was opening up to settlement, people began to come to the area in droves, looking for great land and better lives than they were living elsewhere in Canada or Europe. One of the earliest groups of settlers to arrive were part of the Bull Outfit, which was named for the oxen that were part of the driving teams bringing settlers to the area. Coming from Ontario, they brought farm implements, goods and supplies to begin building lives in the area. Travelling from Ontario to Edmonton in 1909, the Bull Outfit was made up of several families including the Shirks, Smiths, Crabs, Waltons, Lossings, Flints, Cranstons and Millers. All members of a religious group, they would travel along the Athabasca Trail which was common for settlers to use. Once the families arrived, they would establish a post office under the name Red Willow, although some sources say that it was called Red Low, but it was established in 1910 with R.C. Lossing serving as the first postmaster. The first store was opened one year earlier, and the children were educated out of a shack with nine students being taught by a Mrs. C.A. Drake. Soon after, the community began to form in those early years, and the name would eventually change to Beaver Lodge. The name change was because of all the lodges that were built along the river by the Beaver Indigenous. Eventually, two more schools would be built to accommodate the growing number of children in the booming community. In the late 1920s, something would happen that was important to a community's survival. The railroad would arrive, but for Beaver Lodge, it didn't come through the community that was already there. After almost two decades of existence, relatively long in a situation like this where typically a community is only a year or two old when it happens, the community moved. The railway was only two kilometers away, but the entire community was moved over to where the railroad was coming through. When the railroad reached Beaver Lodge, 200 people attended a banquet with a brass band, bonfire, and banquets to celebrate the arrival of the new connection to the world. By 1929, the Grand Prairie Herald published an article about Beaver Lodge and its rapid growth, stating, August 1928, a bear field, September, a railroad grade, October, a hum of building activity. November, the construction continues. January, a regular passenger service. Today, a bright, clean, solid town drawing traffic from 35 miles of wonderful country. At the time that the article was printed, Beaver Lodge was booming with six elevators being built, seven stores, two lumber yards, two garages, 
one hotel, three restaurants, and several offices and homes, along with a brick public school. From there, the community would grow to a population of 2,500 and has become one of the most important communities in northwest Alberta. The Beaver Statue When you go to Beaver Lodge, the first thing that you notice is the giant beaver statue that has become a centerpiece for the community and one of the most popular attractions in the area. The idea for what was called the Beaver Project was started by a local man named Alex, whose name I don't actually know how to say, and I don't want to mispronounce it, but it is spelled L-O-J-C-Z-Y-C. He wanted to give Beaver Lodge something to lift the spirits of the town and bring tours to the area. In February 2004, the idea began to take shape and grant applications were submitted, while donations were canvassed throughout the area. On July 16, 2004, the Beaver Sculpture, which had been hauled in by truck from Calgary, arrived in the community. It would be unveiled on July 21, 2004 to mark the 75th anniversary of the incorporation of the community. Surrounding the statue is an interpretive signs that detail the history, habitat, and behavior of the beaver. It will also one day have murals around it highlighting the history of the community, but more on that later. The beaver weighs 1,500 pounds and is 18 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 10 feet high. The beaver itself sits on a log, which weighs 1,500 pounds, is 5 feet high, and 20 feet long, and it took 90 gallons of polyurethane to coat the statue with 13 gallons of paint and 18 blocks of foam to build the structure, which was built by Heavy Industries in Calgary. Here's Mayor Gary Rycroft. That was a, a brainchild of a local um, entrepreneur, uh, Alec Loisick, pioneered it and uh, basically brought it to, to life through um, fundraising and whatnot and the cooperation of the town and other other business people as well. Uh, like you'll drive by there at four or five o'clock in the morning and there's somebody out there taking a picture with the beaver. Even had the Stanley Cup uh, presented in front of it and taking pictures. The Beaver Lodge Research Station. The station was founded in 1917 by W.D. Albright, who had begun experimenting with grain varieties in the area in 1914, which would transition into the establishment of the Dominion Agricultural Research Substation. Now, W.D. Albright had been born in Ontario on August 15, 1881, and the family would move to a fruit farm near Beamsville, Ontario, when he was 13. In 1903, he graduated from the Ontario Agricultural College and began to work for the Maritime Farmer, a farming magazine, until 1905. In 1913, Albright and his new wife left Ontario and moved to Beaver Lodge. Impressed by the agricultural potential of the community, he began to conduct agricultural experiments on his own land. In 1917, the government rented 20 acres of land to establish the aforementioned substation, which he was paid to operate on a part-time basis. In 1919, he became the superintendent of the station, and in 1940, the entire farm became an experimental substation. One year later, it was designated as a full-scale experiment station, the northernmost one in Canada, with Albright serving as the director until 1945. Through his work, he was able to find lucrative cereal crops to grow in the area, as well as new farming practices. He would also promote the region heavily around Canada, encouraging farmers to move to the area. He would pass away on April 29, 1946 in British Columbia, and in 1954 was named a person of national historic significance. Today, the farm still exists as the Agricultural and Agri-Food Research Farm. Saskatoon Mountain Sometimes called Saskatoon Hill, there is evidence on this mountain of human habitation going back 9,500 years. One of the more interesting facts about the hill is that it was the only site in the area not to be subjected to the effects of glaciers during the last ice age. The plants found in the area were not found anywhere else. The first homestead on the mountain would be owned by Fred Greer. Now, due to its history, the provincial government would turn the area into a provincial park where people could come and gather berries and picnic. Everything would change when the site was chosen for a new radar site and 214 acres of Saskatoon Mountain were leased to the federal government, restricting access to the area for the citizens of Beaver Lodge. 
The provincial park was removed, but parts of the remaining area of the provincial park, not being used by the radar site, were leased to farmers to graze their cattle. The radar site itself would be built on the former homestead of Fred Greer, where a forestry tower had been set up as well. Under the Department of National Defense, the area had a pine tree radar station that acted as part of the early warning radar system that was set up by the United States and Canada in the case of a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Things would begin to change in 1985 when an announcement of the closure of the site came. Among the 49 civilian workers at the site, 26 were eligible for transfer, but 80% of those chose to stay in the area so they could find suitable jobs. By the 1980s, 105 military and 49 civilian workers were at the site. Several proposals were put forward, but Beaver Lodge would submit a proposal to return the mountain to its natural state. Their proposal for CFS Beaver Lodge would state, Our mountain belongs to the community. It was bad enough to give up the site to the Department of National Defense. We do not want the view, the wilderness, and beauty to be denied us forever. Beautiful natural areas are disappearing all too fast. If this should happen, we would rather see the site restored to its natural state. In June 1988, the military began packing up, and by the end of June, nearly everyone was gone from the site. On August 31, 1988, the gates closed for good on the radar site, and over the next year, all evidence that a radar base had been there were removed, except for the radar tower. The site was then seeded with grasses and allowed to regenerate to its natural state. In 1992, the site was returned to the province of Alberta, and the main radar tower would stay in place until 1994, when it was finally demolished. On July 26, 1995, Saskatoon Mountain was designated as a natural area that covered 1,766 acres, and today is an Alberta provincial park once again. Here's Mayor Gary Rycroft. Saskatoon Mountain, uh, Saskatoon Mountain is, is about uh, five miles straight east of us. It formerly was housed the uh, Canadian Forces uh, Station um, military, military base, a radar station. A big impact on the community. Uh, is, like, I started school with kids from New Mexico and uh, have been all over the world, different stations and whatnot. So it, it has played a, a ma- massive impact on, on our community. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The McNaught Homestead One of the first homesteads set up in the Peace River region was the McNaught Homestead, set up by Charles and Eliza McNaught in 1911, when they were part of the second group of Christian Association settlers to come from Ontario to the Beaver Lodge area, although they were not affiliated with the group. In those early years, the farm consisted of six buildings that still stand at the site, including a two-story log house, a pump house, two barns, a schoolhouse, and a chicken coop. This is one of the most complete collections of buildings dating back to the first wave of settlement into the Peace River region. Another important aspect of the homestead is that the daughter of Eliza and Charles was Euphemia McNaught, who came to the region with her parents in 1912. She was a highly gifted artist and would attend the Ontario College of Art in 1929, where she was instructed by J.E.H. MacDonald and Arthur Lismer 
two members of the group of seven artists. She would come back to the homestead of her family and set up a studio in the former schoolhouse on the property. She would gain national renown for her work, including having it displayed at the 1931 Calgary Stampede. In 1942, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King would commission her to document the construction of the Alaska Highway, and she was a founding member of both the Grand Prairie Art Club and the Beaver Lodge Art Club, and was made a lifetime member of the Alberta Society of Artists in 1985. In 1977, she was awarded the Alberta Achievement Award of Excellence in Art, and in 1982, she was the first recipient of the Sir Frederick Haltane Prize. She would pass away in 2002 at the age of 100, and after her death, many of the pieces painted at that schoolhouse on the McNaught Homestead were featured in the National Gallery of Canada, and the homestead itself is a provincial heritage site. Here's Mayor Gary Rycroft. It's the McNaught Homestead. Um, I know the McNaught family were one of the original families that moved into the neighborhood. Uh, Euphemia McNaught is a, um, a world-renowned uh, artist. Uh, she's passed away now, but she had uh, studied with uh, with people from the Group of Seven um, in Ontario at, at different times in her life as well. So, a, a wonderful. Uh, uh, artist culture in, in this community as well. The South Peace Centennial Museum. Within the 40-acre museum, you will find many amazing structures, including a trading post, church, community hall, general store, blacksmith shop, barn, as well as a large collection of antique tractors, steam engines, horse-drawn wagons, and antique automobiles. The museum itself was established in 1967 with the mission of preserving the past of the area. The museum also features a grain elevator that was built in 1929 and located in Albright, near to Beaver Lodge. Originally owned by Federal Pacific Grain and then the United Grain Growers, it was sold to Foster's in 1964. Originally the plan was to move the grain elevator already located in Beaver Lodge to the museum but was in poor condition and could not be moved as a result. In the spring of 1996, two United Grain Elevators in Beaver Lodge, which had both been built in 1928, were demolished. Here's Mayor Gary Rycroft. Centennial Museum, I think, started in about 1968, 70 in that neighborhood. Uh, um, it is a full working museum, uh, has uh, steam tractors and uh, a massive tractor parade every every year. And they have every piece of equipment uh, running on museum days. Uh, they have old uh, sawmills and uh, shape mills and um, blacksmith shop. They have everything working. The Beaver Lodge murals. Now I come from Stony Plain, and there are dozens of murals which I actually covered in my episode about Stony Plain last week. So for me, murals have always been a great way to show a community's history. In Beaver Lodge, there is a project underway to bring murals to the community. And I had the pleasure of interviewing Jim Drabble about the Beaver Lodge mural project. So let's go over to him. So our murals that are going up at the Beaver actually form kind of the circle and the continuation of, you know, what was laid down, what happened over those 450 million years, picking up with the, um, the pioneers and stuff like that, taking this right up to present time. Now, in theory, it, it goes very well, but try to compress 450 million years into six panels becomes a bit of a challenge. I have the ideas. What I don't have is a drawing skill to do that, you know, but we're working on that and that is coming along. It's just not going to be our first um, project because it, it is so encompassing, you know, so we're, we've actually um, moved from that. We're going to do one and maybe two separate simple train station murals and then develop continue to develop our um our you know that those um those six panels that at the beer there's also you know 
there's our group that's involved. There's a town that's involved, you know, so it becomes um, a little bit of a ball that gets passed around between everybody, you know, make sure that nobody's interfering with anybody and we don't distract from the beaver itself, you know. And they are going to be back to back. So we actually only need room for three panels. So there'll be the, if you will, the, the prehistoric history, and then that'll wrap around and you will then finish up with say the oil and gas and renewable energy, you know, coming from that on the back of it. So yeah, if they go to uh, Facebook, Beaver Lodge Mural Foundation, they'll find a bit of our history and the things that we've been doing The Beaver Lodge Campground Unlike many campgrounds that just have facilities and camping stations, the Beaver Lodge Campground actually features a historic site. The Lower Beaver Lodge School, which was built in 1912 and used as a school from 1912 to 1947, is actually at the site. It was eventually restored and moved to its present location in 1986, where it was dedicated to the pioneers of the Lower Beaver Lodge and District. For a period of time, it was a tourist information booth until the cultural center was built. Notable residents. Jerry Holland was born in Beaver Lodge and would go on to be selected in the third round by the New York Rangers in the 1974 NHL Amateur Draft and in the second round by the Cincinnati Stingers of the World Hockey Association in the WHA Amateur Draft. Choosing to play with the New York Rangers, he made his NHL debut in 1974-75, when he played one game, scoring one goal for the team. That same year, he would have 79 points in 67 games with the Providence Reds, earning the Rookie of the Year award for the AHL. He would return to the NHL in 1975-76, where he played 36 games with the Rangers, scoring 7 goals and recording 4 assists. While that would be the end of his NHL career, he would play 72 games in the AHL the next season, 11 games in the CHL in 1977-78, and 22 games with the Edmonton Oilers of the WHA in 1977-78, earning 3 points. His last year of hockey would be 1978-79, when he had 61 points in 52 games with the Spokane Flyers of the PHL. Mel Knight was born in Beaver Lodge on July 30, 1944, and would work as a roughneck and journeyman mechanic before founding his own firm that would eventually employ 55 people. Retiring in 1996, he would be elected to the Legislative Assembly of Alberta in 2001, serving until 2012. During that time, he served as the Alberta Minister of Energy from 2006 to 2010. Jeff Walker was born in Beaver Lodge on November 28, 1985, and began curling at a young age, joining the Charlie Thomas rink out of Grand Prairie that would go on to win the Canadian and World Junior Curling Championships. Over the course of his curling career, he would appear at the Briar nine times, winning in 2017, 2018, and 2020, and finishing second in 2016. He would play in the World Championships twice, winning gold in 2017 and silver in 2018. In addition to these wins, he has 10 Grand Slam victories, beginning in 2014 and continuing to 2018. Matt Walker was born on April 7, 1980 in Beaver Lodge and would be drafted by the St. Louis Blues in the third round of the 1998 NHL Draft. He would alternate between the Blues and their AHL affiliate teams over the next 10 years. After one season with the Chicago Blackhawks in 2008-09, when he had 14 points in 65 games, he signed a four-year $6.8 million deal with the Tampa Bay Lightning. In 2010, he was traded to the Philadelphia Flyers and would finish his career with the team in 2011-12. Over the course of 314 games in the NHL, he had 30 points. I hope you enjoyed that look at Beaver Lodge and its history. It's a really great community and I encourage you to check it out. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can find hundreds of articles on Canada's history by going to my website. Go to canadaehx.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.